Well, it seems to me that it might be interesting to sort of go over some of the things that have been called to my attention in nearly 67 years of work with people in trouble. Now, trouble is a rather common occurrence. Most people have a little of it as they go through life. Some few they have more than their share. And at the present time, we may say in wide terms, the whole world is in trouble. But actually, there has to be a reason for this. And one of the reasons is that nearly all of us have to learn through experience. No matter how much good advice we receive, we have to do it our way. And sometimes we're right, and that's fine. But very often our way is not the best. And then, having made a serious mistake, our next problem is to try to blame it on someone else. <laughs> this is quite normal, and with fair success we can find someone who apparently can be held responsible. All else failing, and no person being available, we have to cast our burden upon the Lord. <laughs> Actually, when you begin to study it, you begin to realize what it's all about. All these responsibilities that we face are necessary to the growth of the person. Unless something of a problem developed along the way, the average person would never become mature. He would continue to go on living in a fool's paradise unless something happened to him which proved conclusively that it needed more intelligence, more stamina, more strength, more insight than he possessed. So that all, nearly all learning, all growth, is an effort to be more comfortable in a world of innumerable discomfitures. So we try to see what it's all about. Now, of course, some of the best mistakes we make are made at a time when we are least informed about life, and that is in childhood and early maturity. Inexperienced, without background, in facing the realities of life, we make decisions that could influence our entire lifetime, and we have very little background reference frame upon which to make decisions. Of course, theoretically, young people are supposed to turn to their elders for instruction. Actually, this is less and less popular. Actually, the elder is not necessarily much better off, because he failed to turn to his elders when he was growing up. And we have a chain reaction of immaturity trying to adjust to the challenge of existence. So we have to try to figure out what we can do about all this. And we begin to study the problems of life, and we find that dispositions and temperaments are traceable to several different potential sources. There is a popular belief that we inherit certain dispositional tendencies. Whether this is true is still a matter of controversy. Some feel that we do not inherit uh, these attitudes, but that we inherit bodies in which the chemical functions produce these attitudes and continue to do so generation after generation. We also have the belief that in some way or other the individual brings with him into life some record, some understanding and insight from previous embodiment. This attitude is now generally held by a great many progressive thinkers. They feel that we are here to fulfill the law of karma. Now, to most people, the law of karma is century retribution. Well, actually, the Sanskrit term is just as justified as a progress forward, happy circumstances, as it is unhappy circumstances. 
But the problem with karma has one weakness, which we are beginning to notice for the first time. And that is, it is not possible for the individual to bring into the present life a lesson depending entirely upon past existences. By the time he made the karma, he was living in a different type of world. The problems that we face today were unknown. Back in the time of the Caesars, no one was worrying over computers. Back in the Middle Ages of the Crusades, no one was really worrying very much about television. These blessings have come later. <laughs> so we come into this world perhaps carrying certain wisdom that has universal meaning, but we are not prepared from the past for the exact situations of the moment. We have to therefore ter take certain basic characteristics of integrity and insight and try to apply them to circumstances that have never existed for us before. This makes a problem that is a little difficult, again, to adjust to. Now, there are also many who feel that uh, some of our problems arise prenatally, uh, that the unborn child is already being influenced by the world into which it is coming. If this is true, it might explain why nearly all children come into the world crying. <laughs> if they've had a little taste of what's coming, I don't blame them. <laughs> On the other hand, a lot of people have a good time. Many people are well treated. A great number of persons grow up in pleasant home life. But there's still in the world a great mass that has not had the proper protection during childhood periods. The parents have not done what they should do because they didn't know themselves what they should do, or if they did know, they found ways of avoiding the responsibility. So we come in here with all kinds of difficulties. Now the most common difficulty that we have out of the past is neurosis. The uh, person growing up is fortunate if he reaches maturity without being hurt in some way. He is hope fortunate if he has not been disillusioned in something. If he has not already found this world a very difficult place to live. And as a result of a series of happenings to himself, he begins to develop a neurotic tendency. He may be born in a family that is broken up shortly after his birth. He is then raised by one parent only. This cannot be helped, but it is still a basic cause for neurosis. As he goes along, a, a single parent home may require considerable neglect of his needs and of his purposes and he is forced to place himself in a secondary position in relation to income and finance. All these things dig down into the nature and just remain there as a series of gloomy attitudes, gloomy thoughts. And uh, when various things happen, the individual kind of drops back into some of these occurrences to explain his present problems and his present weaknesses. So the uh, problem of the neurotic tendency is nearly always associated with incidents which have developed early in life, which contain elements considered to be unfair, unreasonable, or beyond the power to accept and understand. So we take, for example, the broken home syndrome, which is now extremely common. To assume that this means nothing to the growing child is a delusion. I've had many people come to me in their 60s and 70s who have the most bitter reflections concerning the first 10 years of life. They blame most of the failures that they have passed through to the lack of companionship, support, understanding, insight, and affection which they have lost in their opening years. Now, it might seem that these things are just transitory, 
that the individual, if he is given a fair education and meals and home and um, clothes, should be grateful for this. But there is something more than this. Maturity requires a, a development of affection, personal regards. It requires causes to champion, appreciation, interest, significance, and a certain amount of gentle but firm guidance along the earlier years of life. So if this is missing, the individual is in trouble. Now alongside of him, belonging to another generation, is the person responsible for this situation. A person who found a broken home or was caught in one, who had to go out to make a living to support herself and the child. Her life was neurotic and frustrated, and she passed these tendencies on to the child also. All these things are perfectly reasonable, perfectly natural, and more or less inevitable, but the result is neurosis. Now, as the person grows older, it's always possible to do something about neurosis. We don't have to continue to accept it indefinitely. We can find ways to grow out of a neurotic situation. To do this, however, requires a certain amount of conscious effort. The individual must try to make these adjustments. He must try to outgrow his own infirmities. But what happens? He comes along at 50 with all the infirmities and admits frankly that he hasn't been able to outgrow them. That perhaps in the daytime he could handle it, but at night the old dreams came back, the nightmares, the pressures of outrageous circumstances. And throughout life there is a certain psychic deformity set in, a crippling of the natural joy of life or the natural good spirit to face situations. All of this also means that there must be some corrections possible. And now we're beginning to recognize these corrections. Education is not only teaching the individual the ABCs or preparing for him for a profession or occupation. Education must help young people to get over the scars of neglect, misunderstanding, and false pressures of society. The child, the young person growing up, must be taught to be stronger than circumstances, must be taught to recognize the real meaning of the things that happen to him. Everything happens for a reason. If the happening dominates, the life is damaged. If the individual takes hold of the happiness of the happening and understands it, then there is a definite forward motion. So the problem of finding explanations for pressures must be and should be part of the training of every young person. He should be taught to overcome the limitations and restrictions of his own childhood. Now, if he has been a very happy child and has been well taken care of, you may say that this is not reasonable or necessary. It wouldn't be in this case. But then there are other factors that sneak in. One of the worst of these is the spoiled child, the child who has everything, the child who everyone idolizes, the child who it is hoped will never have to do an honest day's work as long as it lives. <laughs> this type of child is also uh, pampered and lives in a kind of uh, psychological paradise through these early years. But somewhere along the line, the angel comes and casts the young person out of paradise into the very tough and difficult world which he is going to have to face. When this happens, the spoiled child is at a great disadvantage. He expects to be pampered all his life. It develops into the way of which he thinks, his job in which he attempts to establish himself, and if he marries, he expects to be pampered by his wife. All these things become the basis of trouble. And in this trouble, the pampered person gradually comes under the neurotic pressures of his own unfortunate background 
and gradually develops bad habits, many neurotics going to narcotics or alcoholism. Now, this is a long story, but somewhere along the way, philosophy has to step in and try to do something about it. One person out of every three, probably, is a potential neurotic. This is because the ailment hits in so many different ways at so many different periods in life. Many are affected collectively by war, others by Great Depression, still others by pestilences. All kinds of negative circumstances create the havoc which gradually eats into the optimism of the person. Now against this, in, this external pressure, there has to be internal resource. And that is where religion, philosophy, and idealism have their part to play. It is necessary for the individual who finds neurosis slipping into his life to recognize that he must outgrow it. He must find out the true solution to the dilemma which with, he, with which he has lived for a large part of his lifetime. He must gradually come to recognize that he cannot forget the past, but he must interpret it correctly so that it no longer damages the present or the future. He must find ways of capitalizing on the neurotic liabilities which he has inherited or accumulated. He must realize that every problem is not only a responsibility but an opportunity. For most people, this world is a clinic in which each individual has to solve his own ailments. It is very important, therefore, for the individual to find ways to transform a neurotic pressure into an expression of gratitude, that the individual discovers that his troubles are the things that have done the most for him, and his successes are the things that have done the most to him. And he has to gradually realize that growth is an overcoming of ignorance, and that problems all lie in the errors of ignorance. No matter how brilliant a person may be, if he cannot handle his own disposition constructively, he is ignorant. No, we have no faculties of education or facilities to take care of this kind of problem, except in clinics or private counseling. But even the best of private counseling cannot meet the full dis difficulty. Actually, in the last analysis, each pro person must solve his own problems. If a patient takes a counselor a problem, then the counselor is going to counsel in terms of the fact that the problem might have been his own. He does not counsel in the terms of the compound disposition of the individual who has come to him. So the work finally settles down to the most inexpensive and te tedious of all processes, and that is putting our own lives in order. So we come along and we find, as I know a case that came to me, a uh, boy growing up with a broken family, which was broken while he was only a couple of years old, going on through one pressure after another, tossed about from one relative to another, ending up with a stepfather not at all interested in him, and uh, a mother unable to cope with the situation. So looking back from manhood upon his own childhood, this particular person felt that he had been badly treated, that he had been neglected, that he was born to suffer, and that it was inevitable that he should break down under the pressure of it all and be sorry for himself for the rest of his life. Now, this doesn't pay off, but it happens in millions of cases. So this person has to be gradually taught that each one of these disappointments presented him with a new point in life, a new realization of facts. The fact that he came from a broken home made him one with thousands of other young people who come from broken homes. These problems have to be solved. The individual who has no support from family must develop as early as possible support from within himself. And in the periods of neurotic pressures all the way to the end of life, 
The great answer lies in taking hold of it, the, mis- the problem, whatever it is, and transforming it into its message, revealing once and all that, has, that it is capable of being a tremendous uh, advantage to the person to have gone through these difficulties. It's hard to believe that, perhaps, but those who have triumphed over the weaknesses of themselves are the world's best people. Those who have too easy a life get into trouble later. But it is possible for those who have had a too difficult a life to smooth it out and have a serenity of years when the time is right. Also, we have to realize that uh, many families, cruelty is a factor. Children are cruelly treated. Adults are cruelly treated. And cruelty is something that is very difficult for a sensitive person to understand. In the case of cruelty, the victim very often becomes belligerent and strikes back and tries to fight their way out of the dilemma. They begin to develop hatreds and uh, antagonisms that go through life. And sometimes they develop a, a revengeful determination to hurt others as they have been hurt. Now, this, again, is simply a sign of ignorance and weakness. Most of these problems exist and go on existing generation after generation because they have not been met at their beginning by our educational system. We educate an individual as though he was really a kind of well-oiled machine. We do not recognize the actual individuality of the individual. We do not realize that each of the children in a class in school is a different person with a different background, with a different reaction to the pressures of environment, with a different ability or lack of ability to understand the meaning of what they are trying to learn. So it becomes very important, uh, if possible, that the child should have a type of education included by means of which optimism and understanding, sympathy and adjustment and the forgiveness of evils, all this has to be part of the education if the person is not going to be a neurotic. Now religion does a great deal for this in some cases, but on the other hand we suddenly develop another problem and that is the the religious neurotic, (laughs) whose trouble isn't that he lacks religion, but he lacks the way to handle it. And he also very likely belongs to some conservative group and finds it necessary to constantly impose his religious convictions upon other people. And one of the quickest ways of becoming a neurotic is to try to convert somebody else. Because each person has his own way of doing things and has the priceless realization, or belief at least, that he is entitled to his own life way. Religion can help, however. Religion can help to preserve the moral code of the person. And the stronger the moral code, the more easily he may be able to handle the pressures of outside. If he has a strong conscience within himself, he can avoid most of the pitfalls which could cause him definite trouble. But the strong conscience factor is slowly fading out of society. Today, the average person is not guided by con- by conscience, but is guided by convenience. The individual wishes to do that which he wishes to do regardless of consequences. And as a result of this, he lands with a counselor who can do very little for him. They can help but they cannot help a person to get over his dispositional peculiarities until he is fully convinced he's better off without them. He will try, usually, to get rid of the things that don't mean much, but it sometimes takes a long time to dig into a person's inner life and reach the really sore spot. He has it carefully covered. He has it upholstered in every way possible. He nurses his problem as though it was the most vital part of himself. The more he nurses it, the more trouble he's in. (coughs) But he is going to conceal it. He will reveal minor faults of temperament and try to get away without touching the major one. 
And it takes a long time, because until he gets to the major one, his life will never straighten out. A lot of it can be done by working with the religious side of human life. Religion, to be useful, must be non-dogmatic. It must be tolerant, and it must be gentle, but it must be firm, and it must teach the individual to seek the good in everything and be willing to recognize the good even if he doesn't like it. On one of the uh, apocryphal statements attributed to Jesus uh, relates to the time when the disciples were walking along the road and see that saw the decaying carcass of a dog. The disciples drew back in horror at the unhappy sight. Jesus stood and looked at the animal for a couple of minutes and then turned to the disciples and said, Pearls are not whiter than its teeth. To find the pearl in the dilemma is very important. Yet in everything somewhere there is something good, something valuable, something te what, that teaches us what to do or something that teaches us what not to do. All the way along, life is trying to press us toward accomplishment. The more we resist accomplishment, the more steadily it prods us on, often with to a great deal of discomfiture. But we must try, in every incident that comes along, to get the message, to see whether or not we are handling it. If when the message comes along that a problem is approaching, are we ready for it? Are we sufficiently integrated within ourselves to be able to handle a moderate-sized difficulty with dignity. A big dig difficulty might take a little more practice, but a moderate-sized one should be handled with dignity by the average person. Now, if this problem comes along and the individual fights it, that isn't dignity. Denies its existence, that isn't intelligence. The answer to the problem is it must be solved. Now, in some religions and some philosophies, the effort is made to throw these problems on the Lord. And when we don't know what to do next, to ask for divine help. That is perfectly proper and correct if we have used every available resource of our own first. If we have done the very best that could be done, and the problem is completely beyond our control, then we must resort to the divine will. But we do not like that usually, because while we say, let thy will be done, underneath of it, underneath this, we have a sort of a little sub-voice that says, let my will be done. <laughs> we want it our way, and we hope God sees it that way. <laughs> because if he doesn't, we're in trouble. <laughs> But we must try in the beginning to find out what the problem can be, how it can be handled by ourselves. Are we shirking it? Are we afraid to take it on? Is it more comfortable to suffer? Many people have the most joyous time suffering. But, unfortunately, very few of us can suffer alone. And the professional sufferer generally makes many other people miserable also. So that isn't a good answer. The good answer is to realize that the individual himself is capable of solving any problem that he faces. If it is completely beyond his capacity, it isn't even a problem. He doesn't know it exists. But if it touches any part of his own experience, he should be able to make a fairly dignified solution. Now, another type of problem that comes along, we find, is loneliness. Loneliness is something that sometimes appears to be very unkind and very unreasonable. Yet in the long run of things, loneliness is the common state of everything that exists. The smallest little bug in the greatest star is alone. Loneliness is an inevitable, because between each individual and the world around him, is the vast complex of his own personality. He must bridge across from an inner nature to an outer life. 
In most cases, this bridging is not effective. Not all it should be, at least. But in every case in that life, there comes a time when we must learn to get along with ourselves and learn for once and for all that we can be good company to ourselves. We can find all kinds of things to do to counteract loneliness. We can develop a, a, a vocational interests. We can take on responsibilities for the simple pleasure and plentiful opportunity of service. We can do all kinds of things to break up the concept of loneliness if we really want to. But once we, <coughs> once we get a certain degree of aloneness, the tendency is to stay with it, to nurse it, to become less and less adjusted, and to finally end up by being antisocial in every sense of the word. Now, the person who declares war on society is actually declaring war on the university of life. The individual who walks out on his own world, walks out on his responsibilities because he doesn't like them and is therefore able to develop a beautiful argument why he shouldn't accept them. This person is avoiding the normal burdens of living. He's bound to be lonely in the end. A lonely person is one who has not been a friend, a true one, therefore cannot have a friend. But every lonely person has a privilege of something that other people do not have. For example... A family in which all the members are busily engaged has very little loneliness, but very little privacy. There are times when each individual should be alone. Alone to think through things. Alone to put his own life in order. Alone to meditate upon the larger realities of things. So that loneliness is actually a condition that must precede the experience of enlightenment. The, en the enlightenment of the wise destroys forever the illusion of loneliness. The person who has found his own center finds with it a world of marvelous opportunities and privileges. The individual finds the universe friendly instead of frightening. He finds the life he's living rewarding instead of punishing. These things have to happen within the person. They cannot be delegated by others. We can feed and clothe other people in their emergencies, but we cannot bring happiness to an inner life. Each person must do it for himself. And the ancients and the moderns also have come to the conclusion that the most perfect way to attain happiness is to stop trying to be happy. Rather, let trying to do better things, trying to help more, trying to learn more, trying to love more. These things are the sources of associations that are permanent and valuable. So, in religion, we have this problem. I know one case of a young woman who was about to be married when her uh, fiancé was killed in war. She was in her early twenties with a broken heart. In her early eighties, she still had the broken heart. Never got over it. In her middle fifties, took holy orders and remained the rest of her life in a nunnery. She was never able to transcend this disaster. Many people thought that she was very religious, very devout, and very conscientious. She was all these things, but she cut off her life, a tragedy which she could not help, took away from her the only thing she thought could ever make her happy, and because she thought that way, she was never happy again. This type of circumstance must be overcome, because it destroys the value of lives. It frustrates the entire purpose of growth. This young woman should have had a proper season of regret and mourning. She should have been hurt to a proper degree. And then she should have gathered herself up and found things to do. If she couldn't be happy, maybe she could make others happy. 
And it was far better to do that than to bury yourself in a religious house. So everyone has to make adjustments and make decisions as they come along. Another case, quite different, but with the same general pattern, was that in which a young woman was 50 years uh, the total slave of her own widowed mother. This widowed mother, who loved her devoutly, and the daughter who loved her mother devoutly, formed a little package, too small a package, of frustrations which prevented either one from advancing in any noticeable or recognizable degree. By the time the mother died in her nineties, the daughter's life was useless. Therefore, a strange sadness came over the daughter, which was quite understandable, when finally she also took solace in religion. So religion is a kind of mechanism by means of which a great deal of sadness, solitude, and frustration will find some comfort, not a solution, but a solace. Not an answer to the problem, but a way to carry it a little easier. So with all these problems, it all comes around to how do we carry them a little more easily. And I think most of our people that are thoughtful people know about these types of things. When in doubt as to what to do, forget yourself. Forget all that has happened to you. Stop telling all your friends your miseries. Get over constantly regretting this. Something you did at 20 has ruined your life. Get rid of the fact that the past can destroy the future. It can't unless you let it. Therefore, those who have suffered in the past should not carry their sufferings into the future. In fact, they shouldn't have carried them into the present. Those who have had various unhappy happenings, some of which may involve guilt mechanisms, must realize that the person who performed those happenings 50 years ago is not the same person as the one who is living today. They say that every seven years, every cell in the human body changes. And it is also true that in the course of a lifetime, every cell in the human soul changes. Life becomes different. The person who made a mistake in the past is not the same person who is alive now. And there is nothing binding this person to the past but memory. And memories, while you cannot destroy them, you must learn to use them and not let them abuse you. Now, one way to handle a memory situation very carefully is to go back to the occasion and see whether or not you really understood it when it happened. Were you really actually as blamed as you think you were? Are you, were you in those days far enough advanced in thought, understanding and insight to make a corrective decision? If out of simple ignorance you did the wrong thing, if out of simple lack of insight and understanding you made mistakes, so what? Everyone makes them. The mistakes of the first 20 years of life are always present, or nearly always, in some form. But there is no reason why they should be projected into modern time. They should never be allowed to cloud or discourage a life. And any religion that demands complete repentance for these types of ailments should be carefully avoided. The problem is not to forget the problem is to learn the mistake, gradually developing a richer and fuller life, learning from a mistake the thing not to do again. We have a great number of people in society who had a mistake at 15 or 20 and have been having one every year since, which isn't very helpful. They haven't learned anything. Now, your own past is a book. It's a clinic. Lord Bacon's observed in his essay on the Pyramid of Pan uh, that every experience of life is part of an experimental career. Under the heading of experiments, in laboratories, various compounds are made and combined and separated and rearranged. In life, these compounds are attitudes that are brought together, separate and rearranged also. But in life, 
the great laboratory is where knowledge is gained. It is where ideas, hopes, beliefs, and notions are tested. And every individual who has made a bad decision in life has tested a a notion and found it didn't work. These things add up to a gradual psychic education in which the person becomes wiser and wiser until he can control his own life with dignity. This is all that expected. It is not a forgiveness that is most desirable. It is an outgrowing of mistakes. It is simply developing within ourselves an understanding and capacity which makes it possible for us to forget the troubles and remember only the good that came out of the experiences. So there are always things to learn. And those who rise above their own mistakes are the world's best people. They are the ones who are going somewhere and are going to get there. They are the ones that take care of themselves before nature has to step in and cure them. They are the ones who have understood the importance of their own lives. If we look back upon our life, each one of us has a textbook. Every once in a while, some cheerful character decides to write a book about themselves. If this may or may not be completely truthful, a number of people who have written books that I happen to know have written about a life they wish they had lived, but not the one they, had, they actually did live. But even so, biography has its place, and autobiography in some way becomes a soothing uh, uh, vocation. It helps the individual to capitalize on his own life by selling several hundred thousand copies. But the real point behind all of it is the personal growth that we get. Looking back upon our own lives, we can see how we could have done a dozen things better. We also will gradually realize the uselessness of carrying grudges. A grudge usually is an objection against a person. And there's hardly anyone who doesn't dislike someone. This is traditional. This is clinical. It is a fact that nearly all of us have someone we just hope won't drop in. (laughs) We have some that we know we would throw out if they dropped in. (laughs) Others we happen to wish to ignore. Some that we want to say never met them or never knew them. But nearly everyone has something. Now this ignoring or this grudge is another thing that has to be analyzed and broken down and studied. A great many of these grudges are not as honest as they seem to be. A great many grudges are just plain old-fashioned jealousy. A grudge may be something that we resent in a person who is doing things better than we are. Rather than trying to get to do it better ourselves, we depreciate the person who does it better. We also have grudges against individuals who haven't agreed with us at various times in life or have committed some action against us. Sometimes the grudge is against dishonesty, sometimes against gossip or envy. But a grudge is nearly always a dislike based upon real or imaginary causes. Now, the difference between a real and an imaginary cause in these particular circumstances this is negligible. Regardless of whether we were justified or not, the grudge has to go. Something has to happen to the grudge. I have known people who have come to me with grudges, and the person against whom they held the grudge had been dead for 20 years, but it had no effect on the grudge. It was recognized as the prime cause of a great disaster in life. If it hadn't been for this grudge, these people would have been happy, well-adjusted, successful human beings. But the deceased individual against whom they held the grudge uh, destroyed their lives, did everything to them that was harmful and terrible and were beyond possible forgiveness. Well, all this is just talk. Actually, no matter how bad anyone is, we've got to realize the fact that we must forgive our enemies and do good to them that despitefully use us. This is therapy, but it is not a therapy that is quoted very frequently. It is true 
that we might have cause to feel that we have been ill-treated. But this does not permit us to continue to hold this attitude. The attitude that we must have will be constructive indifference. We must say to ourselves, this is no longer our problem. We do not wish anyone harm or ill to anyone. We do not wish punishment or despotism to anyone. We simply decide that we can live our own lives in our own way without these other circumstances intruding themselves. Most of them are imaginary. We have them all the time that come in that have been badly hurt by somebody. Sometimes these hurts are pretty real. A woman whose husband has been taken away from her by another woman has a tendency to have a grudge. And you can't very well blame her. But the answer to the matter is that having worked the grudge over a little bit, the thing is, forget it. It's not going to do a bit of good. Let these other persons go as they will. If the person who holds the grudge is the one that's going to get sick. So all, this, all attitudes that destroy health are unfortunate. Regardless of cause, regardless of justification, what makes you sick is not good for you. And nearly all animosities and antagonisms lead to destructive circumstances. The individual seems to draw more of the same, especially if they become involved in a morbid uh, acidity over the, issue, over the issues. What has to be is that no matter what happens, we must separate in peace. We must give up all this idea of hoping something terrible is going to happen to someone else because they deserve it for what they did to us. This attitude is absolutely wrong and will damage the person who holds it. Now we can say all this sounds like moralization. That doesn't mean too much because people can hold grudges and do. They can be jealous and are. Uh, they can be neurotic and will be for time to come. That therefore, that there is no reason to assume that these vital factors are important to the individual himself. The answer is they are. The answer is that they shorten the physical life, destroy health, interfere with careers, alienate relatives, disillusion their children, and lead to all kinds of mistaken relationships and life based upon desperation or exasperation. Therefore, they must no good. No one can afford to hate anything. We may not believe in some things. We may wish they were different. We may do everything we can possibly do to change them. But just blank hatred against something we do nothing about is a very dangerous emotion. We must try to put principles ahead of hatreds. If a person performs an act that is outside a principle, that isn't the right kind of act, that isn't honest or honorable, we have the right to disapprove. But by disapproving, we have only the right to affirm our attitude and, if necessary, relinquish the association. We cannot carry the grudge. We cannot try uh, to solve some of these problems for other people. Another interesting factor comes in the practitioner. The practitioner usually is a person with considerable experience in handling human problems. The practitioner, however, is also an individual. The practitioner, no doubt, has had their own life problems. They also may have come from the same endangered background that the client came from. They may have the same problems, but the practitioner also has its, his or her own attitude towards things, has her own conviction about realities and illusions, and probably has a little formula as to how to get people out of their troubles. So uh, as this come, comes along, the client must realize that the practitioner cannot solve the issues of another person. Not, a practitioner cannot tell you how to live, or who to like, or, how to, or why to dislike, or why you're lonely. 
The practitioner can only advise you as to what to do with your problem. The uh, practitioner who tries to give you a decision uh, takes the right way from your right to make your own mistakes, and you will have to. But the practitioner can point out that you have this mistake, and it's up to you to do something about it. The practitioner may also then be able to go through the assets of your personality to find out your skills, your abilities, your dedications, your interests, your hobbies, your avocations, and find out things that might be of value and remind you of them. But the practitioner cannot solve your problem. The most that anyone can do is to help you to have the courage, the strength, and the integrity to solve the problem yourself. This is why the clergy, more or less, has dominated this field. It is because the clergy throws everything to the Lord. And the Lord, in this case, operating upon the sufferer, must operate through the disposition of the patient. Therefore, in prayer, meditation, in honest uh, Exhibit exhibition of mistake through all the various contrivances by which the person is caused to face themselves as a religious duty. These things can help. They can also overdo situations and cause further pressures. But generally speaking, anything that causes the person to realize his own responsibility for his condition is constructive. It helps to solve. Now, most people have never had a, a good analysis of capacities and potentials. Very few people are really aware of what they could accomplish if they put their efforts into a constructive pattern. Some have had some experience. Some have had secret hopes and desires that they would be able to do certain things in the course of their lives. All of these things can add up to a very valuable and important change in policy of living. The individual who is alone too much should seek associations outside of himself, not to convert them or not to do what they do, but to share openly and freely the experiences of, of each other in, a, in an effort to find greater values and greater depths of understanding. All these things finally add up to the fact that sit down quietly by yourself and say, how do I feel? And if the answer is that you feel terrible, then the time has come to find out why. If you say to yourself, I wish I was dead, you don't mean that. In most cases, you wish somebody else was dead. <laughs> but in any case, the discouragement, the frustration... The fact that life isn't worth living and that the faculty of memory is fading because we never used it correctly, these things are depressing. And as life takes away the edge of the energies of youth, we sort of sink into a solace of our own, which is far from constructive. So wherever there is a problem, and if you can look around and do not see a world in which there are good and things ha good things happening, you're in trouble. Now, in this particular emergency that we're in in the world today, it's becoming more and more common for people to develop strong neurotic tendencies. Nearly everyone is against something in these times. Nearly everyone feels that they have been personally hurt or personally offended, that dreams that they have hoped for have been broken and, and discarded, that the world is in bad trouble and there is really nothing to do to make one particularly happy about anything. Well, this is the first fundamental principle. But is it true? Some people would like to think it's true. But a clinical physician might differ from them. We may also say that in 1986, we perhaps had one of the most important years we've ever known. We are gradually wearing out the inevitable consequences of error. We are coming face to face with the fact that we cannot break the rules. And one by one, as we try to break them, 
these rules have a tendency to break us. Little by little, it is gradually appearing more and more obviously that things have to change. And things have to change constructively. And the old selfishness has got to die because we can't afford it any longer. We might have tried to do things before, but there was new land to take over and always possible to have a successful career. Now we begin to wonder. We begin to estimate what the next 50 years is going to mean in populations, in natural resources, in pollution, and all these things. And suddenly we are beginning to see in the world the types of disorders that are inside of ourselves, but we haven't recognized them. We were just unhappy because we didn't feel good. Well, people don't feel bad just because they feel bad. There's a reason of some kind. They have broken a rule. They have overlooked something that was necessary. They have done something that was not necessary. So today the pressure of society is like the neuroses of the individuals. We are suddenly discovering a world of neurotics, a world in which nearly everyone is afraid to live. Nearly everyone doesn't know what to do next. Now this sounds like a terrible mess, and it is. But in the universal plan of things, there is always a reason. That reason is right. And the end of that reason is that we will make the adjustments necessary to meet universal law. In our excitement, we have forgotten that we live in a universe of cause and effects. When we remember that and keep the rules, we will be very much better off, and we will discover that all the suffering we have gone through has been well repaid by the fact that we finally found a solution to the mistakes of humanity. Now, this same type of thing is what's happening inside of people. The world's dilemma is reacting into the personal life of the individual. The world is in trouble because of the way it acts. The private individual is in trouble because of the way they act. They are part of something which cannot win. They are part and parcel of a great competitive system that cannot succeed. And in all of it, all of it, in all of its branches, in all of its parts and its departments, we have overlooked the basic principle of humanity. Love ye one another. Now it's going to keep on getting rough until we find that out. But when we find that out, accept it and live it, then we are beginning to grow. We are maturing. We are gaining an insight that we could never have had we not had to earn the right to be better people. So it's the same with the individual. When he gets tired of suffering, he'll do things to stop it. But while he is still content to struggle along the best he can, he will make the same old mistakes and fall back on alcohol and narcotics. So it's a problem of getting hold of the facts. Each person has a right to be a constructive individual, regardless of the world in which they live. No one can be destroyed by a mass psychosis, even if it is d- dynamic and pressing. We have to surrender to negative things or we remain positive. So in our problem with people, The people are involved because of the community problems. The community problems are there because of the people. We are here in the mess we're in because we are selfish and haven't prevented a mess. And when it came along, we tried to keep it going. We tried to build good, substantial homes over vacant lots. You can't do it. So all through the way of life, we are being taught And we are here to be taught. We are here to make the same mistakes until we stop making them. We are here to gradually learn the great lesson that when we keep the rules, they will keep us. We are here because we are here to grow as citizens of an eternity. And that these citizens have got to grow up. We are vaguely but forcibly not maturing properly. So it's very important to every person to clean house 
to get rid of all the negative excuses for not being able to do what they should do. Get over the idea that we are privileged to cause suffering because we have suffered. This is not the answer. We have the privilege to cease to suffer because we have found that that is the way of peace for all concerned. So all the way along we have this problem of allowing the past as history to dominate us. There's always been war, so there always will be war. This is not the way of life. The or way of dishonesty in government. There's always been corruption. There have always been dictators. The history of the world is a mass of mistakes made ten- intentionally or accidentally, and every civilization of the past has risen and fallen. This is also in our personal lives. People of all ages have made their mistakes. Little by little, however, all of these groups have grown in some way. We are the past. We are all that has gone before. We have gained along the way. And the number of thoughtful, well-intentioned, and dedicated persons is increasing all the time. We are here because we need more growth. We need another course. We need to get a higher degree of education than we've ever had before. And that is possible only because we have a greater need than we ever have before. And due to our own evolution, we have a greater insight about this need than we ever had before. All of us are going along all right if we take hold of ourselves and get rid of the negative pressures that allow us to accept that which is not right. We do not have to suffer because some people think it's inevitable. We, If we do suffer for one reason or another, it surely should produce some constructive consequence. Suffering might be like a term in prison. And the trouble now is, as soon as the prisoner is out, he does it again. As soon as our pain stops, we do it again. We do not learn the lessons. And because we don't learn the lessons, we still have them. I think, therefore, that uh, out of most people who have counseled, most uh, scientists who have been in the psychiatric or psychological professionals' work, that the the whole fact is definitely that here come these people. They stand upright, they look pretty good, they have fair abilities, many of them have graduated from good schools, most of them have jobs, many of them have families, and they are all a wonderful bunch of potentials. They could do great things, and nearly every one of them is hung up on something. There's something they can't handle. There's something they don't know what to do about. And actually, if uh, a person who doesn't know what to do about it went to a professional and said, I don't know what to do about it, the professionals would probably say to him, well, how do you think you ought to handle it? And then the person would tell the same answer that the professor will have to tell him. He knows. He knows what he's doing. But he wants to forget it. Because it interferes with some sense of fulfillment that he wants to to nurse. We have that same problem in all the fields of life today. Our entertainment field is plugged, is cluttered with this type of thing. Entertainment simply because we feel like it. Social crime is rampant simply because we do what we want to do. And then we wonder why we're in trouble. You can't break the rules and not suffer. And whether it's a family with three or four members or world, you've got to keep the rules. And those who keep the rules find something out of it that is really tremendous. They discover, for one thing, that they can be right without all the rest of the world being right also. There is no evidence that all people are going to come to a similar discovery at the same time. Each finds it for himself when he allows it to happen inside of himself. The answers to everything that we are seeking, really, lie within us. They lie within the soul of the human being. They lie within the divine factor at the base of all human life. Inside we know what is right. 
But with the mind and the emotions and the body, we fight against it. We want to gratify the emotions, we want to gratify the appetites of the body, and we want to fulfill the ambitions of the mind. And that divine factor which is within us is neglected, denied, and ignored. Therefore, if you want to get over any kind of negative attitude, it's in you to do it. There is something in you that will heal any ill that is caused by the mind. But it's something that you have to work with. You have to determine to do it. You have to put the common good and your own survival uh, in front of the negative attitudes which you have been inclined to hell. I know one individual who said they just couldn't get over temp temper fits. So what did they do? They went on tranquilizers. They took all kinds of pills to cure temper fits. <laughs> which, of course, is a, a bit of idiocy in itself. <laughs> They're just trying to drug themselves out of a bad disposition. So every once in a while, however, they had to come up for air, and when they did, the disposition was still there. <laughs> and finally, they became interested in a religious approach to the problem, and they were told definitely that prayer and meditation would probably help. So they tried it, and it did help. And they gave God the credit, but it was the God in themselves that did the job. It had a chance. The higher part of ourselves had a chance to accomplish the natural good. And the, this chance had been delayed for years for the tranquilizers. But until the other attitude was available, there was nothing else to be done. So the answer to all these things is that help Mental and emotional health does depend upon keeping the rules, uh, keeping them in every sense of the word. Uh, to keep them means to obey nature. And nature is the most amazing cooperating creature that ever existed. Do you realize that nature is a term we apply to a conglomerate of universes, of cosmic systems, including everything you can think of, from bugs to angels? It contains all the infinite confusion, so-called, of life. Stars, meteors, comets, everything you can think of. And yet nature is in perfect order. Nature handles the whole problem quietly and simply, and there are very, very few mistakes made along the way. It is because nature is depending upon universal law to support it. Nature is keeping the rules by which nature itself was brought into existence and by which it must continue to the end of time. So that all of us can do the same thing. And around this season of the year is an awfully good time to start some of these maneuvers to see what can be done about things. Uh, how about dropping a card or two to somebody whom you haven't written to or spoken to for ten years? Or make it five years. We're not going to be cruel on this matter. <laughs> but somebody that you have ignored because you resent them. They may turn around and send you a resentment card in return. <laughs> And they might tell you they don't want to hear from you again. But that will be them telling you that is their business. What you are telling them is your business. If you have made the proper move, you have fulfilled the need. If you have done it honestly, with a sincere desire to heal a dissent or a discord, you have achieved the purpose for which you have intended namely to bring peace to the world. If others don't accept it, you are not responsible. But you'd be surprised how number many will accept it if it is done with a good spirit. Also, we can try to look through the confusion of the moment. As a, is the job too heavy and too big? Are the responsibilities more than you can handle? Are the cost of living outrageous as far as you are concerned? If there are all problems that are disturbing your inner life, try to solve them. Try to solve the problems if, uh, of limited funds, 
by limiting extravagances that which you might think are necessary. The uh, simpler the life, the nearer to the truth it is. And too many possessions are the basis of more trouble than any joy they've ever brought. In the same way, looking at the world, try to see the great plan behind things. The plan of the ultimate recognition of the universal brotherhood of humanity and fatherhood of deity. Try to recognize a great and benevolent plan, personal or impersonal, however you feel about it. A great plan that says all things must work together for good. Evil cannot survive. If you have two good deeds and put them side by side, they coalesce and support each other. Put two evil deeds side by side and they destroy each other. Therefore, evil cannot win. Evil cannot end the great divine plan. It has to succeed. And any individual who stands in the way of that success will suffer a little. So better get out of the way of progress and into harmony with it. And try to end forever and ever any negative attitudes in yourself. Try to increase your own inner uh, potential. If you are at leisure, study, work with it, serve various community sources and causes, and be sure that you have a daily life that is as useful, constructive, and kind as you can possibly make it. This is the way that will ultimately bring you internal peace. It will also prepare you to be part of a great evolving way of existence, which is based on the inevitable victory of good, the inevitable victory of love over hate, of truth over error, of wisdom over ignorance. These things together are the end. And we are fortunate, probably, in 1986-7, that this condition is as intense as it is. We are reaching the point where we cannot throw it away. We cannot any longer turn away from it or close our eyes to it. And when an ailment reaches that degree, there's only one answer. You've got to cure it. And uh, this is the same thing that happens with a patient seeking a physician or a psychiatrist. They seldom go until the situation is very far advanced. But when there is nothing left to do except grow or perish, nature says you can't perish, so you might as well start growing. There's no way out of growth. It is inevitable. Nothing that ever existed can avoid it or evade it. In some cases, however, it is slow to come and painful. And this is because we have opposed it and failed to develop the potentials within ourselves which justify us in expecting a good and happy life. I think most of us is working on uh, plans for self-improvement and seeking ways to serve others in their needs will find already that these, de- these dedications have become precious interludes in their lives. That helping people is a beautiful job, if you do it right. If you try to live for them, it is a difficult and impossible job. But if you can inspire inspire people to correct themselves, to reestablish their hopes, to find again the wisdom and strength of a relationship with infinity, if we can help to lawn people to realize that their loneliness is not necessary, that their loneliness is not intended. We are all intended to be busy, busy living, busy doing, busy growing. These are the things that we should be concerned with. If we have lost those who are close to us, even this we must carry with dignity. For all these things happen and always have. But never in any of these happenings is God cruel. All things work together for the greater good. And every problem that we have is a unit of growth in disguise. 
So if we keep that kind of attitude and work with it, I think maybe next year can be a pretty good year for a lot of people. I think it's going to be a much better year for a great many nations also, because we're gradually waking up. We're gradually becoming aware of things. We are gradually outgrowing the belief, the false belief, that our existence here is just a small span of years that we should make as comfortable as possible. Actually, our existence here, existence here is a short span here to make possible an eternal growth or to contribute to an infinite unfoldment of our life potential throughout time and space. We are bound to grow. And the only thing we can do is slow it down by self-pity, jealousy, hatred, and all this type of thing. These are the mistakes which, if we continue to make them, can damage us seriously, but cannot destroy us. We can be tortured by our own mistakes, but we cannot die from them. In due course of time, the truth in ourselves is resurrected and takes control over the personality, and we are be once more the children of the infinite that we are in substance whether we know it or not so in this season when we are all thinking about trying to be as nice and wonderful as we can let's try very hard to say that we can just wipe out forever any unpleasant or unhappy thought against any person this is not a, 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 an easy thing perhaps but it's easier than you realize the reason it is difficult is because so many people have built a mistaken life upon that excuse. They have insisted that this other person or persons has damaged them. They are not unhappy because this person exists, but they have been the cause of all kinds of misfortunes down through the years. This is not true. The individual has caused maybe the original incident. The individual who was hurt has repeated it, multiplied it, and exaggerated it until in turn it damaged the life. If we do not hold these negative thoughts, they can't damage. And if they are damaging, get over it and carry into the future only the growth, wisdom, love, friendship, and understanding that you have brought to fruition within yourselves. We are all growing, and with the grace of God, and with an insight into the requirements of natural law and a willingness to work together in the cause of good, the ends we seek will come in the fullness of time. Well, I think that's probably it.